Welcome to our video today on Bayonet Charge from the Poetry Anthology. This is a poem by Ted Hughes. Um, as you can see, a bayonet here is the, the sharp blade on the end of this rifle that the gentleman on the left is holding. So by the time you get to the bayonet charge, um, it is kind of a last resort. You've run out of bullets and you are expecting to use that last defence, that bayonet on the end of your rifle in kind of close combat to save your own skin. Let's have a read of the poem so that we can get a feel for the mood and the tone as we read along. If you can turn to page 36 and you can begin to make notes ready for your amity. So, bayonet charge. Suddenly he awoke and was running. Roar in roar seemed hot khaki, his sweat heavy, stumbling across a field of clods towards a green hedge that dazzled with rifle fire, hearing bullets smacking the belly out of the air. He lugged a rifle, numb as a smashed arm, the patriotic tear that brimmed in his eyes, sweating like molten iron from the centre of his chest. In bewilderment then, he almost stopped. In what cold clockwork of the stars and nations was he the hand pointing that second? He was running like a man who was jumped up in the dark and runs listening between his footfalls for the reason of his still running and his foot hung like statuary in mid-stride. Then the shot slashed furrows threw up a yellow hair that rolled like a flame and crawled in a threshing circle, its mouth wide, open, silent, its eyes standing out. He plunged past with his bayonet towards the green hedge, king, honour, human dignitary, etc., dropped like luxuries in a yelling alarm to get out of that blue cracking air, his terror's touchy dynamite. Now that you've heard the poem read through, I'd like you to have a look at these images, please. So we have a variety of images here to represent lines or sentences in the poem. Um, can you match up the image to the key quotation um, and think about why that image appears? It will help you with your revision and to select quotations that we can discuss later on. Thank you. So we have a selection of these images here um, to look at. First, top left is this green hedge. Now, ordinarily, green symbolises nature and youth and vitality and health and green equals go, as my children would tell me. Um, so normally, green is quite a positive thing for this man to be running towards, but we know that what lays beyond that green hedge is actually potentially his death because that is where the gunfire is coming from and what awaits him. So there's an odd use of this colour and this symbolism of nature here to actually show that nature in this particular um, instance is almost against him because of what awaits behind this luscious green hedge is potential death. Uh, second image, so the middle on the top line, is obviously cold clockwork. Um, and that k -k sound, the alliterative cold clockwork is quite brutal, um, almost as if time is against him because it is cold and unfeeling and uncaring. Um, and there's a sense of inevitability about cold clockwork, um, that he is where he is meant to be. And if he's meant to die, he will die. Uh, top right, we have a threshing circle. Um, so what would happen ordinarily in the field, there would be a place laid apart for the crops to be put down. And then you need to be beaten um, to thresh apart the wheat and the husks um, to be able to collect up what's valuable and get rid of the excess. So it tells us here that this land that is now a war zone was once agricultural and sustained life and now it is destroying life. So there's that odd contrast here between nature is productive and helpful and now is destructive in this instance. Um, then bottom left we have the yellow hair um, and so the shot slashed furrows threw up the yellow hair that rolled like a flame and crawled into this 
threshing circle. Again, the hare is in its natural environment. It is a part of nature. It is an animal. And here is being destroyed by humanity's revenge against itself. Um, so it's about nature becoming punished by humanity and that odd, odd kind of juxtaposition between what should be happening and what is actually happening. OK, second image on the bottom line is of some dynamite. So we have there in the final line, his terror's touchy dynamite. Dynamite is obviously quite volatile. If it's touchy dynamite, then it's uh, ready to explode. It's potentially dangerous. And this is him describing his emotions and his personality. He is on edge. He is about to unleash um, pain and suffering on the world and the people behind the green hedge. Um, then we have next along, we have some molten iron. So it says the patriotic tear that had brimmed in his eye, sweating like molten iron from the centre of his chest. So what was once a patriotic tear, the love of his country and moved him to emotion is now um, this industrial um fiery metal humanized weapon that burns intensely inside of his body and um, so it's a shift from kind of poignant sadness to intense anger and energy and ferocity um which is a really nice image about him becoming less human and more machine then finally we have i quite i quite enjoyed finding this uh, picture for you um we have a statue that's frozen mid stride so that is line 15 and his foot hung like statuary in mid stride so this is the point where he's most in danger his body has frozen him solid in the middle of this charge um, because his fear is so intense. So he's frozen like a statue or statuary in mid stride. And that is the pinnacle of danger for him. As we know, um, you need to weave and move so that you're less likely to be shot. So I hope you've got those down. OK, let's have a look at stanza one from bayonet to charge so straight in we go with this adverb suddenly he awoke and was running um, now this is called in media res um, and is an amalgamation of that and a bit of mise en scène now mise en scène means setting the scene for the reader um, we're instantly empathizing with the narrator because we are suddenly into the action much like the character who is later described so that adverb suddenly he awoke and was running sends us straight in, which is in media res, um, which means straight into the action. It's all go. There's no slow build up to the pace here. Then we have the uh, dash to roar in roar seemed hot khaki. So the first roar is he's feeling raw, which is painful and open and isolated. Um, the word raw is repeated, but the repetition has dual meaning. So the second in raw seemed hot khaki means that his hems of his khaki outfit are raw seamed, which means opened and there's no hem available. Um, so it tells us how impractical the uniform is and rushed almost to. Then we have his sweat heavy. Now the heavy here tells us the volume of his sweat, how it's weighing him down and there is plenty of it. He's stumbling across a field of clods. Now a clod is a great big lump of earth so it tells us that this field is broken up and is meaning that he is stumbling around which tells us that it's frantic and uncontrollable. Um, he is, however, heading towards a green hedge that dazzled with rifle fire. So the green hedge here tells us this is nature. Uh, the colour green stands for purity, for health. It's a positive colour. And that's juxtaposed here with this dazzling rifle fire that dazzled him behind the green hedge. Um, dazzled can mean amazing and beautiful, but can also mean blinding and full of danger. 
So there's this odd contrast here be between this green, uh, bountiful, natureful hedge and this mechanised weaponry that sits behind it. Then we have his hearing the bullets smacking the belly out of the air. So here the air is personified as having a belly and is being attacked and smacked by the bullets that are ripping through. Um, so the personification of the bullets attacking as well shows that they are the enemy, they are coming for our character. Then we have he lugged a rifle numb as a smashed arm. This is a simile to describe his rifle as being numb like a smashed arm. Now if you have a smashed arm it means that it's useless, it's redundant and here his rifle is described as being like a smashed arm and therefore um, it's lugged so it's strenuous, it's painful and heavy for him to carry but also it's numb so it's lifeless, it's a dead weight which tells us that the bullets are redundant and therefore he only has his bayonet up for close encounter fighting. Then the final lines of the stanza are the patriotic tear that had brimmed in his eye, sweating like molten iron from the centre of his chest. So patriotism is obviously the love of one's country and the had tells that it, us that it is lost, it is no longer there, therefore there is no longer a patriotic tear escaping and instead he has is sweating so the water is coming out in a different way like molten iron so this simile here uh, from the center of his chest now the center of your chest is your heart so it could be describing how intensely he's feeling and he's becoming almost weaponized industrialized and mechanized here um, so no longer a natural human being with emotions and feelings for his love of his country, but now he is becoming a weaponized and um, like a machine. So stanza two. In bewilderment then, he almost stopped. Now the dash at the end of that line means that we get a pause slightly there just after the word stopped which the pause replicates his hesitation he almost stopped so he didn't quite stop but that dash gives us a half breath at the end of that line to replicate him almost stopping he's in bewilderment which means he's confused his body is starting to catch up with this early kind of awakening and throwing into the action so this is all about the physical and the mental here in this stanza and um, line 10, he thinks, in what cold clockwork of the stars and the nations was he the hand pointing at that second? It's obviously a rhetorical question. He's beginning to think here about what on earth has led him to this position in time. This is all about time here. So the cutting alliteration with the cut sound and cold clockwork is brutal and cutting auditory here. Um, if the clockwork is cold, it means it's a machine, it's unfeeling, it does, it's the opposite of being personified here. Um, also stars and nations, um, if it's it's the cold clockwork which represents time, if the stars and the nations, stars represent fate, the nations represent dictatorship and being told and informed how you must act. So that's about control. He feels out of control here of time and place. The last bit with the was he the hand pointing that second of the rhetorical question, it can replicate either the hand that points him to an order or the hand of a clock. And if it's the hand of a clock here, it means that he once again is turning into something mechanised, something that's put to work, something functional rather than human. His choice has been taken away from him and he now just has to tick along and keep going. 
Also, um, bombs have clocks, okay, that are mechanized and weaponized as well. So this is all about his lack of humanity and control at this point. Then we have, he was running like a man who has jumped up in the dark and runs listening between his footfalls for the reason of his still running. So this is about fear here. Um, it reminds me of the time I decided to take up running in the winter um, and then terrified myself running around in country lanes and um, thinking somebody was going to jump out at me any second. It definitely didn't last very long, but it's about that fear of the unknown and that fear feeling of uh, anything could happen at any moment and it's terrifying and um, this run-on sentence as well is quite long and descriptive it sets that pace of that frantic keep going keep going keep going moment and is replicating how his body is responding the use of this third person narrator as well gives us an almost uh filmic setting it's this mise-en-scene again it's setting the scene as if we are watching omnisciently this man and trying to play catch up and empathizing with him as he moves and um, so it creates that kind of descriptive um nature so that we can feel and hear and think exactly how he's feeling then we have so we've just had that frantic run 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 moment and then we have and his foot hung like statuary in mid stride, full stop. Now the sejura there, okay, that full stop midline 15, um, again, the punctuation is dictating the pace here. It means that we pause with the sejura as he pauses. We also spoke about this earlier. If he's statuary, which means like a statue, he's still mid stride, that means he's stopped in the middle of the open field on the way towards the hedge that's dazzling with rifle fire. This is danger here, okay? And um, it makes us panic like he's panicking. If he's frozen still, that means the terror has overwhelmed him and his body has kind of stopped him in middle of fight or flight mode and it's, it's dangerous for him. Then end of line 15, the other half after the sejura, it moves into with enjambment this third stanza here. So then the shot slashed furrows threw up a yellow hair that rolled like a flame. The shot slashed as well, sh sh sound. Um, it's almost sibilant here and it's replicating the sound of the bullets as they whiz past him as he's frozen still. Again, making us empathise and sympathise with this man and urging him as readers to keep moving, keep going. But he's frozen watching this poor uh, yellow hair that is rolling like a flame, which we'll talk about in the next stanza. So here's stanza three. We obviously had at the beginning of the stanza the enjambment moving through um, as the movement continued after that sibilance of the bullets. Um, so we start the stanza with threw up a yellow hair. Uh, so that's the shot slashed furrows threw up a yellow hair that rolled like flame. Here the threw up means that nature, almost the field has been personified as if it's regurgitated this hair out from inside itself. Um, so it's a regurgitation of nature here that's been flung out um, in front of him. The yellow hair is rolled like a flame, so that's the simile like a flame, um, which makes us think that it's hot, it's on fire, it's in pain, therefore it's being destroyed by this human warfare. Um, it then crawls into the threshing circle, so it's um, with its last bit of life, um, while suffering, it's moving to retreat into this farm, farm land, which normally it would have been safe and peaceful in. Um, but now it's become a kind of war zone. Then we have this kind of brutal description of the hair, its mouth wide open, silent, its eyes standing out. 
Um, so this is this kind of quite brutal description of the destruction of this animal in front of the character's eyes, the death of nature in front of him. Humanity has caused this. So it's, it's nature versus humanity again. And humanity is winning here and is destroying nature just as he is being weaponized and mechanized and his human nature is being destroyed. Nature too is suffering. Um, so line 19, he plunged past with his bayonet towards the green hedge. Plunged again means that he started moving again. The triggering of watching this animal die in front of him has triggered once again him starting off. It's a really violent and urgent verb there, the plunged past. You've also got alliteration as well. His bayonet is once more raised up and he is headed back again towards this green hedge so you have the repetition of green hedge because it is his final potentially destination um again then we have line 20 this is what's going through his mind so king honor human dignity etc dropped like luxuries in a yelling alarm so we have the listing of the three things king honor human dignity um, these are things that should motivate him to keep going. You know, you they, we're told that you fight for your king and your country, for your own honour, for your human dignity, for your pride. Then we have after this listing of these three things, though, um, the word etc., which almost trivialises those things. He no longer is motivated by his king, by his honour, by his human dignity. Um, they're now discarded because they're dropped like luxuries, which is a simile um, in a yelling alarm, as if they're just things that, that other human beings um, take for granted that are unnecessary now. And it's like he's in full fight, fight or flight mode and the humanity in him, the things that ordinarily would motivate him, have been um, thrown out now um line 22 so dropped like luxuries in a yelling alarm to get out of that blue crackling air so blue crackling is really sensory we've got the color blue which is very uh, alien and unusual to be seen in a battlefield um the sound as well crackling is almost onomatopoeic it sounds exactly like the sound it's replicating which means as readers, we are still immersed into this kind of um, this mise en scene, the middle of the scene, what's going on around us. It's very auditory, very visual. It's also quite beautiful. Blue crackling air sounds quite pleasant, but at the same time, that's juxtaposed with the obvious danger that the air crackling represents, which is the sound of those bullets exploding around him. And then the final line, um, which I believe is the point where he becomes and loses all of his humanity and becomes a machine or a weapon, is his terror's touchy dynamite. Touchy dynamite in particular tells us he's a weapon. He's volatile, unpredictable. He's no longer in control. Um, there's a sense of a kind of urgency, of violence, of unpredictability here with him um, and he's touchy it's like he is about to explode he's been put at his most extreme and that concludes the stanzas now that we've read through all of the poem i'd like you to complete an amity for this poem so that's about mood ideas three techniques and finally your response um, to ensure that you've got all the notes that you require to form a written response in your exams. Um, other poems that you could link in particular to this poem are below. So you've got Exposure, which also deals with the power of nature versus humanity, uh, the brutality of war and fear. You've got Storm on the Island, which equally deals with power of nature versus humanity, although in a role reversal because nature is defeating humanity um, and fear again prelude you have the power of nature presented um when the mountain seems to be attacking um the child how that is an individual experience for wordsworth but also the fear that he experiences as a result that lasts with him 
uh, in war photographer, you have the effect of war on humans um, because the war photographer is obviously shaped and changed as a result of what he witnesses. Um, equally, it's about individuality and how they cope with trauma and this having to detach oneself from your human emotions, which is what the war photographer goes through, how he has to separate himself um, in the moment of war. Uh, finally, remains. Um, you've got trauma of conflict in remains, the impact that has on the people on the ground um, at the time. Obviously, remains deals with PTSD, um, whereas bayonet charges in the moment how the body reacts to trauma uh, with that kind of reaction of that fight or flight and him kind of pausing and freezing and hesitating as he goes. I hope you've enjoyed this poem and thank you for listening. <laughs>